Okay, good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure to participate in this, this conference. I mean, looking at the agenda, it's clear that organizers have made a terrific job in exploiting these synergies between high quality research and policy in the area of banking that was expressed by Clay Buch in his keynote, keynote address. And a good example of that is precisely this, this very first session of the, this conference. And we are going to basically discuss three papers. We are, comments, uh, we are going to hear presentations on three papers uh, on topics which are not only quite particularly relevant, but also quite interlinked with each other. So we are going to discuss, it, uh, for instance, the impact of the SSM on, on the credit behavior and the risk profile of uh, supervised institutions. We're also going to discuss actually the impact of the SSM on the ability by supervisors to impose their valuation preferences without using sort of formal accounting enforcement powers. And we're going to discuss in the, after the coffee break a, a paper on, on the impact of the SSM on profitability. So it's pretty much basically on the area of effectiveness that uh, I was expressing before. Not only effectiveness of supervision, but effectiveness, effectiveness, effectiveness of SSM supervision. So I think this is a very interesting set of papers. I'm sure that we're going to have a very rich discussion. So we'll start with a presentation, a paper by, uh, by uh, Jose Luis uh, Pedro, uh, with co-authors, Carlo Altavilla, Mi Miguel Rufina, Martina Soba, and Frank Smets. As Miguel, you're going to present this paper, right? Okay. So the paper is Supranational Banking Supervision, Credit Supply and Risk Taking. European evidence from multi-country credit uh, registers. So the rules of the game are that you will have like 20 minutes to make your presentation. Then we have 10 minutes for a discussion, and then we'll go for an open Q&A. Okay. So Miguel. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so this uh, this paper is um, work on uh, again. We are going to to. Um, to be investigating the, the role of centralized bank supervision on credit supply and, and risk taking. Uh, and this is um, work done by, by, uh, by a team uh, as described and as, uh, and as seen here in the, in the slide. So um, myself, Carlo Altavilla, who is here in the, in the room and Frank Smets work at, uh, with, at the ECB. And we worked with uh, Martina Jazov and uh, Jose Luis Pedro who are of course, at um, at universities. Um, So let me start by uh, very quickly summarizing what we'll be doing in uh, in this paper. So again, we are going to to look at uh, the role of uh, of centralized compared to to country level uh, supervision, decentralized. Uh, we are going to see what is the impact that this can have on uh, on credit supply and on risk taking, and then we are going to try to identify what are the associated mechanisms. Now, why do we see the differences that uh, that we see? And uh, basically, there are a few hypotheses that we put forward and, uh, and that we test. No? One of them is that there can be, uh, there can be differences in the, um, in the ability or actually in the resources that different institutions have. No? Maybe when you, when you centralize supervision, you can pool resources and you can have maybe um, you know, access to more information. You can have uh, the ability to to attract staff that is, uh, that, is, that is more trained to offer higher education. Now, another possibility is that uh, there are differences in, uh, in incentives. So when you, have, um, when you have a local supervisor, they are, uh, they are closer to the local economy. So maybe they have uh, incentives to, um, to protect either uh, you know, banks that are systemically important 
or uh, firms that are particularly important for the local domestic uh, economy for uh, for employment. Now, a third uh, possibility and group of um, of uh, let's say characteristics that might matter is also, of course, the the quality of the of the institutions that you might have in uh, in different countries. You now, that might affect the that might affect the governance of the institutions but also can be related to, to the insolvency framework, which is important also for, um, you know, aspects like um, uh, kind of forbearance of loans, um, so-called zombie firms, you know, that are not viable, but there might be incentives to, to still support them. Now, how do we do this? We are going to do this by looking at uh, evidence from, um, from uh, a set of different credit registers. And we will see that uh, this is crucial for our analysis because on the one hand, the credit register gives us access to, to detailed information that allows us to properly identify these effects. But on the other hand, it's crucial to have these different, um, these different credit registers rather than a single country one because a lot of the differences that we mentioned in these channels are aspects that differ only uh, across countries. No? So therefore this combination of cross country and uh, then kind of within bank and the cross firm variation is what is going to allow us really to, 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 to show these results. Now, um, there is, of course, quite, uh, quite a bit of literature on these topics. I'll not spend a lot of time on this because also people here uh, know the literature. Some of people in the, in the room actually also contribute to this, uh, uh, to this literature. Um, again, one important point here is that uh, it, we, you know, compared to the, compared to the rest of the literature, for, especially for this period, where the SSM was created, we have these multiple credit registers uh, that allow us to, to really identify the results. And also we are going to, to look here at uh, a combination of, um, of, uh, of these underlying, uh, underlying uh, different mechanisms in, um, in a combination that uh, we believe has not, had not been uh, done before. Now, just to briefly uh, present the, then the data set that we, that, we, that we are working on, which like I said, is, um, is crucial for the analysis. So we have uh, data that covers the period from 2012 to 2017, so that we cover here, uh, crucially, 2014, no, when, bank, uh, when the supervision became centralized. We have credit registers for um, a large set of countries, now these include countries that were um, more affected by the by the sovereign crisis, so countries that were, uh, say, in a weaker economic situation, and countries that were uh, that were in a stronger one. As we will see, of course, there are also many other differences between uh, between these countries. It also includes non-euro area countries, which is uh, nice as a kind of. Uh, you know, cross check because because there we have uh, we have banks that of course were not subject to the centralized supervision and can and can serve as a as a term of comparison, and then in terms of variables we have a relatively rich set of uh, of measures that allow us to understand the um, the the loan the the loan exposure so we understand. You know the amount of the loan, but also we know about uh, we know about committed loans you know, that were uh, that were uh, not necessarily drawn, but were uh, but were already granted. We have some uh, some variables on uh, on the on the credit risk uh, of the loans, and then we have variables on the um, on the borrower, and we'll combine this, as you will see, also with some inf with some more detailed uh, borrower information from uh, from other data sets. So one, um, one uh, just uh, visual representation of what the data set looks like. So these are the, the countries that we cover. And the numbers that are there are uh, the relative, or let's say the, the share of, um, of firms that have multiple loan relationships. You know, for, uh, this is something that is, of course, always important for, uh, for us when we are 
doing research and we are trying to to again to identify effects uh, cleaning from from confounding effects because of course when we have uh, these multiple relationships we can use this uh, methodology that was uh, started with uh, this seminal Kwajamian paper that allows us to have the firm time fixed effects and what we see here is that of course you have larger numbers on the right than uh, than on the left because uh, the banks that have or the firms that have multiple relationships tend to have the big ones but more importantly than that what we see is that the the numbers are relatively high so so we can actually extract some uh, some representative information even with this uh, very let's say very um, demanding identification at the same time uh, you will see that we use also um, other forms of controlling for, for borrower risk and for demand, such as sector time uh, fixed effects that are less demanding, but have the advantage of allowing us to keep uh, all the to keep all the all the firms in the sample and therefore be more uh, be more uh, representative of the, um, uh, making sure that we are not leaving out any important firms. So this is uh, the, essentially the, 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 um, the key specification that our analysis is going to be, to, be run, to be run around. So we are going to be explaining loan volumes by a set of variables. These variables, like I said, include some fixed effects that we use just to kind of control for confounding effects to make sure that uh, the effects we see are from the variables that uh, we think they are and not from other, um, from other unrelated effects. We are going to be to be then looking at whether um, what was the impact of the centralized supervision. So you have this soup dummy here you know, uh, that is one when the um, uh, when the supervision becomes centralized. Importantly, for some banks, not for all banks. That's what allows us to uh, to identify the the results. Then we are going to see whether the uh, whether there is a difference also in lending to to high risk firms and importantly the interaction between these two effects. Now, does the introduction of centralized bank supervision affect lending to the riskiest firms? Um, and by, by high risk firms, we'll then have also a different set of measures, not just to just to, to, to have some, uh, some comprehensiveness, some robustness and understand better the, the effects. So we are going to look at uh, you know, firms that have um, the share of loans in, in arrears that the firms have, so kind of asset quality measures. We are going to look at the profitability of the firm, at the kind of more uh, encompassing Z-score measure, and also at the measure of so-called zombie firms, and also combining a set of uh, variables that that it tries to identify firms that are, um, let's say, alive but not really not really viable. So let me start then with the, with the first results. And what we do here, the first exercise that we do is actually we split, uh, we just split countries. No, we have the, um, that, uh, that model that, that I showed you before. So we try to find if having centralized supervision matters for credit supply and for risk taking. And we do the first easiest and most intuitive split, which is to look at countries uh, that we know um, are different in in many respects, and what uh, what do the results tell us? Well, they tell us that the results are different. Also, you see that uh, in in columns one and two, when we look at these so-called stressed countries, not the ones that were more affected by the by the sovereign crisis, first we see that uh, the centralized supervision um, increased uh, contributed to increase credit supply to the um, to the lower risk firms but uh, it contributed to decrease uh, credit supply to the highest risk firms. So let's say less risk taking and more, uh, and more supply to, to low risk firms, which seems like, um, uh, like a nice result. Now again, when you look at columns three and four, you see that results for other countries are different and this motivates a bit the, the other exercises that, uh, the, that I will show you after that try to understand why uh, this can be the case. Now, of course, um, this uh, centralized supervision dummy becomes one in 2014. 
we know that also you know many other things might have happened at the same date. So what we do here is we try to see what happens if we were to define. So if we were to still define this variable identifying the, the banks that became centrally supervised, but we were to do it at different dates, so wrong dates for our purpose, just to see what we would identify. And we can see that if we look at earlier dates on the left-hand side chart, we would not see any difference. But then uh, from the date that we define on, we see a difference between this uh, blue and red line on the left and the difference kind of tends to, to widen over time. Now on the left, the biggest chart is for, is for the arrears. What we do in the, in the right hand side is I show you results for, for these other measures of, of firm risk. And essentially we see that qualitatively the, the results are the same. No, there are no, no major differences. Now again, what do we see when we look at the other set of countries? Uh, the results are quite different, right? Because here instead you see that uh, regardless of kind of the time where, where you are identifying and looking for this difference, you don't really see clear differences between, uh, between, uh, between these two lines. Now, one important point here uh, is, of course, there are many exercises on robustness in the, um, in the paper I will not, uh, not go through, but uh, when we look at the, um, when we try to make the, the exercises comparable, we see that, um, you know, in these, uh, in these stress countries, results do not change. In the others, instead, there can be changes in the results. So I'll not make strong claims on the other countries, just that we don't see uh, very um, so super clear, super robust results for for these other countries. Now, going to the to the first of our of our hypothesis, is it the case then that the difference comes from the from the resources that are available to the to the different kind of uh, of supervisors? And then, if you look here, that uh, at the coefficients that are, are highlighted, this would suggest yes. You know, so what you see here is that uh, uh, when you have, uh, um, let's say, lower uh, resources of the supervisor, uh, these are the cases where supervision tends to, tends to decrease more the risk taking, but also to increase more the, the credit supply to the, to the low risk firms. So some support for this hypothesis of the importance of, uh, of resources. Now, like I said, another, another hypothesis would, would be incentives. And if we think about incentives, probably there can be different attitudes towards, um, towards systemic banks that might be very important for the, for the local economy. And here again, we see some, um, we see some support for, uh, for, for, this, uh, for this hypothesis. Now, um, there is also the other side of um, of the coin. Let's say no, and uh, uh, if the local supervisor has incentives to, let's say, support the economy, especially at the time where the economy is going through a hard period, no, which is a bit what happens with these uh, with these so-called stressed countries. Not only the size of the bank might matter, but also the the relevance of the of these uh, of the firms. For the, for the local employment. And this is what we find also here. Now what we find here is that countries that, uh, sorry, firms that are more important for, for employment are the ones where, uh, let's say, the central supervisor reduces more the, the risk taking compared to the, compared to the local one. Now, the, now, um, the let's say the third group of hypotheses that can be here at work is again the let's say uh, the, the the overall institutional quality now one important thing to to mention here is that it's not that all these measures are identifying always the same countries no we have some differences in the we have some differences that are you know uh, the, the 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 combination of measures identifies different countries and here what we see is that, uh, again, the, let's say the, the overall governance that has to do with, uh, you know, we measure here with indicators of uh, rule of law, uh, of, uh, of corruption and so on, also matters for the, here for the role of the centralized supervision we find. Um, 
and uh, and this is uh, actually the last exercise that I will show you still on the institutional quality that is linked to the insolvency regimes no so here what we see is kind of making the bridge to these uh, to these uh, to these zombie firms and um, and basically what the result tells us is that also the 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 insolvency the quality of the insolvency regimes is quite important um, so where insolvency regimes were weaker before the centralized supervision makes more of a difference and it makes a difference not only in lending to risky firms but specifically in lending to these kind of zombie um, zombie non-viable firms so this indicates that here the um, the, the centralized supervi supervisor by reducing the risk taking to these non-viable firms is kind of creating space to increase um, to increase uh, lending to 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 probably more uh, more productive uh, firms, um, and with this I conclude. So so again, um, we find that centralized supervisors tend to reduce risk taking. We look at the, this uh, these associated mechanisms, and maybe not to repeat uh, again the results. Just one additional point is that we also check. We also have a kind of um, horse, so-called horse race exercise where we try to compare the relative importance of, uh, of these different channels. And what we find is that uh, when, we, when we try to put them all competing, there is stronger evidence for the role of, uh, of incentives and, and quality of the institutions than for the relevance of the, of the resources. With this, I conclude. Thank you. Okay, many thanks, uh, many thanks, uh, Miguel. So let's now move to the discussion. This is Diane Pierret from the University of Luxembourg. First of all, thanks for, for having me today to, to discuss this very interesting paper of Miguel and his co-workers. Um, this is a paper that uh, belonged to one of the key research areas that was outlined earlier by Claudia Bo in her keynote speech. It's about the effectiveness of supervision. And more precisely, it's about the effect of supranational supervision on credit supply and bank risk taking. But the paper goes even further than just identifying the effect of supranational supervision. It tells us also how uh, supranational supervision can affect bank incentives. To do that, the paper relies on very detailed data from credit registers from several countries called Anacredit. It also relies on the introduction of the uh, single super supervisory mechanism, and that also introduced this, this shift uh, from uh, national to supranational uh, supervision for the largest uh, banks in Europe in November 2014. And the main result is a heterogeneous effect of supranational supervision depending on the country. So on one hand, they find that in stressed countries, which are Italy, Portugal, and Spain, supranational supervision increased the supply of credit and reduced risk taking. On the other hand, for non-stressed EU countries, and these are six other countries, they find the opposite result, supranational supervision reduced the credit supply and there's almost no effect on, on risk taking. Then they come with, they provide some explanations for this heterogeneous effect across countries using proxies for what I would call an initial condition of the country before the treatment. So I'm using the treatment jargon here so you understand that this is based on a difference and difference analysis where the outcome variable is total credit granted by bank B to firm F at time T. And they introduce this, well, they have a saturated regression with firm time time fixed effects such that you're looking at um, the credit supply of several banks to the same firm. And the banks differ depending on whether they're treated or not. And the treatment here is a bank that is going to be, um, uh, so where the the supervisory power shift from national to uh, supranational authority to the ECB in November 2014. The control group of banks are going to be banks that continue to be supervised by the national authorities. So the treatment assignment is based on bank size. The treated banks are going to be large banks as usual, and the control group are going to be smaller banks in the country. 
and they augment this regression with a measure for firm riskiness, which takes a value between zero and one, such that the delta par parameter here um, describes a lending response of ECB supervised banks uh, towards zero risk firms while the beta parameter is a lending response of ECB supervised firms to what risky firms. So beta is a risk-taking parameter, delta shows the response to what zero risk firms. And I find in stressed countries that delta is positive, so you have a positive lending response to being supervised by the ECB towards zero risk firms, and beta is negative, a reduction in risk-taking. For non-stressed EU countries, the opposite result um, uh, happens for zero risk firms or so negative lending response to zero risk firms and almost no effect on risk taking. So this is summarized in the table here. You find this difference in signs of the estimated uh, effects of the treatment in stressed countries. Delta is positive, positive lending response to zero risk firms. In non-stressed countries, you have the negative effect and negative lending response to zero risk firms. And the effect of risk taking is on risk taking is negative, so less risk taking for us in stressed countries. While when we when you introduce our firm time time fixed effects in the most saturated uh, specification, the effect on risk-taking of supranational supervision disappears in non-stressed countries. Now, you see there's a huge difference between the treatment effects, depending whether you're in a stressed country or not, and they go one step further in trying to understand why we obtain different treatment effects, why a treatment works on some pa patients and it doesn't work on other patients. And um, to do that, they use this proxy measures. Most of them are at the country level. And these proxies are increasing with corruption or weaker control for corruption in the country. They are increasing in um, biased incentives of supervisors toward their larger banks and, and uh, larger firms that employ a large share of the national workforce. And also increase in uh, low national supervisory ability with the assumption that the ECB has a greater ability um, uh, and because it has a access to a broader pool of knowledge. And they find that on countries that score, that have a high scores on, the, uh, on these proxies, so a high score on corruption, uh, in bias incentives, and low ability, they're basically able to replicate the result for stressed countries. So my comments. Um, first of all, I think the paper does a very good job at identifying a treatment effect on credit supply and bank risk taking for stressed countries. Um, my first comment is I'm not so sure what the treatment really is, might be confounded with several treatments. And then my second and third comment on, on the second set of results that try to explain why uh, we obtain different effects for stressed and non-stressed countries, where there I'm a bit more skeptical, I, I cannot hide it. So the first comment is about the treatment definition. In the paper, the narrative is about a change, a transfer of, of supervision responsibility from the national to the supranational uh, authority. However, usually when you have a change of these responsibilities, when there's centralization or decentralization of supervisory powers, there's usually also a change in the objectives of supervision. And this transition from, to, from national to supranational supervision in November 2014 came with additional uh, efforts. Uh, for example, unprecedented um, exercises like the asset quality review, uh, the EU-wide stress test that had a clear intent of repairing and cleaning balance sheet of the largest banks. This usually comes also with more stringent capital requirements that from the banking literature we know can also affect uh, risk taking. And it's no wonder why we have stricter supervision of the largest banks because not only they are large and they are systemically important, but also because we know they have distorted incentives because of uh, go, um, implicit government guarantees they can benefit from. 
So all what I'm saying is that this transfer of responsibilities, of supervisory responsibilities, happened in a context where there were several efforts to break a bank sovereign nexus, especially in stressed countries, um, together with unconventional monetary policy, in order to reduce uh, market fragmentation in Europe. It's not clear that it's just what the treatment is just a transfer of responsibilities, but it's not also stricter supervision and additional unconventional, unconventional monetary policy tools. So my suggestion here is mostly about clarifying what the treatment is, is, is it just a transfer of responsibilities or, or something more bro uh, a bit broader? And if you want to identify the channel of transfer of responsibilities, probably there are some data that would help you uh, to do that in AQR and use response. My second comment, so now we're, in, in, if we define the treatment well, we know what it is. I think you all have an identification of a conditional uh, average treatment effect on the treated. It's conditional be uh, based on the country of the bank. And I think you're showing that pretty well with the, with the parallel trends. Now the paper goes one step further, trying to explain why we have different effects in different countries. And I think there we have two main problems. One is a measurement error problem when it comes to measuring corruption incentives of abilities this is typically unobservable variables incentives here are measured with bank size while this is typically employed for bank incentives and less for supervisor incentives um, and even if we would be able to measure this perfectly then we still have a nominated variable bias because these measures are most of the time at the country level where they can correlate with a lot of i can imagine corruption or incentives of supervisors or abilities uh, correlating with a lot more uh, variables. Um, important controls would be sovereign risk, differences in, uh, in supervisory resources at the country level, but still we have a cross-section of nine countries. I provide suggestions here, but I have I understand no time. I would, my last comment is on bringing a more balanced view on the advantages and disadvantages of local supervision. Local supervision can also come with advantages, which is a, mostly an informational um, advantage. Local supervisors have more uh, specific information on the, on the local banks and local firms. This last paper here I'm citing of Gigan, Le, Lambert, and, and Wagner actually finds the opposite results of less risk-taking once you have a shift from uh, global to local supervisors. I will stop here. Uh, thanks, uh, a very interesting paper. And of course, you take whatever you want from this discussion. This is what I would do as a, as a co-author. Many thanks, Leanne. Why don't we take uh, maybe a couple of questions from the audience before giving the floor back to, to Miguel? OK, uh, I think you were first, and then Victor. Huh? Hi, um, Ernest from Ernest Dautovic from the SSN. Uh, very nice paper. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I have just a more technical question on this. I didn't understand what is the control group in the stressed countries and in the non-stressed countries. Is this LSIs or is this Czech or Romanian banks? Because it seems to me that only the Czech and Romania are the countries that are not part of the SSM in your sample. Uh, to understand a bit, you know, uh, how these findings could be generalized. And also, in the non-stressed countries, it seems that national supervision or this more restricted supervision led to uh, some contractionary effects based on your baseline findings, meaning that uh, if, you're, if your treated group is the biggest banks in those countries, it means that in Germany we have a contraction of credit due to the national supervision that you that you are trying to, to estimate. Thank you. Victor, please. Oh, you with the hand. Thank you. You don't have a paper. Yeah. Well, my, uh, yeah, it's a nice uh, paper, even an important one, to prove that it was a good movement to transfer supervision to the European level. Uh, and I think it, uh, it proves it. Uh, my questions are to Diane. Uh, 
I share your view about uh, your doubts uh, regarding the explanations why it is different in stressed and non-stressed countries. It's very difficult to do it, and I think it's not uh, really, uh, uh, I think, uh, a convincing uh, result uh, that the paper provides. But I think it's very convincing about the first question. And the doubt you raised about uh, what is the treatment because uh, there are other aspects that were coincidental with the transfer, like the AQR, like the uh, enhanced stress tests, and all of the rest of it. But I think that you, we can consider that the AQR and the enhanced stress tests and all the rest you mentioned happened because of the transfer. So in a enlarged, view about what is the transfer, I think that the first point of the paper is uh, convincing uh, uh, proof, uh, because these other elements that you raised were coincidental and only happened because there was the transfer. Otherwise, there would have been AQR and all the rest of it. Alfredo, let me, if I may, before I give the floor to, to Miguel, complement a little bit what you said and what Diana said about other things going on at the same time as the transfer. One of them being, of course, a considerable, a considerable strengthening of the prudential framework in the, the progressive transposition of Basel III into European legislation, CRRs 2013. So that implies actually requirements of more and better capital for all banks, but the impact is supposed to be more significant, precisely for larger banks, which are the ones a shift from national supervisor to supranational supervisor. So to what extent this type of phenomenon, which, is, which are not related to the, to the creation of the HSM, could actually drive some of the provincial results? So, um, Thanks a lot, very interesting presentation. Um, a, a common more on presentation, really. Indeed, you, there are those older papers that frame you know, this episode only as an episode of AQR, which is also partial along the lines of what uh, Mr. Costanzo just said. Um, I would suggest you have those references in the paper. In the presentation, I would discuss more how these results you know, uh, complement what is already out there because there are a few papers that have some f findings along this uh, along these lines. And I think this would help and save you some of the questions as well. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Stefan Blochwitz from the Bundesbank. Um, thank you for your nice presentation. Uh, I have a question regarding to your model. If I look at your summary statistics, um, uh, then there have uh, the majority of uh, uh, bank uh, firm relationship is just one. So your 50 percentile is one for that parameter. However, in your model, you introduce that as a fixed effect, which must reduce drastically the degrees of freedom of your model. So how dependent is your model on, on these parameter? And um, uh, do you think uh, that the results are driven just by introducing that parameter? Thank you. Thank you very much for all the um, very interesting questions, but of course, especially to to the end for the for the great discussion. Um, so I think. I, I agree with uh, with with most of uh, actually with most of your points, Diane, and and um, and I think it's uh, it's nice to hear them because they can they can shape a bit the way how we present the how, how we present the results. Um, so um, let me say a few points. So on your first point about whether we are looking really at supranational or stricter, I think. Part of the exercises that we have can speak to that. No, like you also said, actually in the in the discussion, no, uh, the the exercises that we have on um, on resources, 
tell us that, uh, or you know, if we have uh, with the centralized supervision a higher share of um, of uh, of, uh, of examiners per bank, this would indeed suggest that uh, that the supervision becomes uh, becomes stricter. Um, maybe that is because resources are more available. Maybe that is because there is a, there is a, there are different incentives. That's what we also look after. But indeed, there is evidence that it becomes uh, that it becomes uh, stricter. Um, on the um, the measurement error, it's uh, it's um, it's a point taken. No, we do it uh, with. Uh, Kind of uh, robustness with uh, with uh, with different measures and different ways of slicing the sample. Of course, um, you know we use firm level data when we have it. Maybe there is even some uh, some nicer data that um, uh, at the, at the bank level that uh, now we can we can discuss more with our colleagues in supervision and we can even um, improve that. Um, on the point about uh, your third point, no, about uh, about global and local uh, supervision and the advantages of having local supervision, I think one important point is that here we present centralized for simplicity, right? But in reality, it's it's kind of an integrated supervision that we have, right? So probably what is uh, what is consistent with uh, with these results is exa exactly this kind of multidisciplinary um, way how the, how the SSM is organized with the JSTs that try to incorporate also the, um, also the, the local knowledge. Um, then let me uh, go briefly to these more uh, specific questions. So what is the control group? Um, we have essentially two control groups. So like you said, one uh, looking at uh, LSIs that are not included in supervision, the other one looking at non-euro area countries. One important thing within these uh, LSIs, we know that, of course, the smallest LSI is very different from the large receive. So one exercise that we do is we look at, let's say, the three smallest uh, SIs and the three largest LSIs to kind of increase the comparability and reduce the, the other effects of, um, of, uh, of size. Um, is there a contractionary effect of uh, centralized supervision in stressed countries? Uh, we would not say so because it's true that there is a reduction in uh, in lending to the riskiest firms, but then, but then, as a counterpart to that, uh, we find actually that this releases space to increase uh, credit supply to the to the low risk firms. So actually, this might be uh, positive rather than um, than negative for the economy. And, um, and one last point on the on the multiple relationships. So indeed, uh, you no know, have focusing on these multiple relationships reduces our sample. But this is why we have also exercises with other controls, you no, know, with these sector time fixed effects that allow us to keep um, to keep the full sample. So we see also that when we keep the full sample with other controls for demand, uh, the results are consistent. And also, you know, it's also the beauty of the of the very large data set that we have is that when, even when we have this uh, this very demanding control, we still keep like a very large number of observations that gives us some confidence. Regulation rather than supervision. Ah, sorry. Yes. No. The yes. The the impact of uh, of Basel three. Uh, again, I think here. Uh, I, I think here the, um, the the important point is also the the this exercise that we do when we when we really reduce uh, the, the, the 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 scope of our control group, no? Because it's true that Basel III is different for uh, has different effect for these receives or for the very small banks, but if we look at these intermediate sized banks where the main difference is really whether they are with the, with the SSM or not. Probably there, uh, the Basel three rules are not so different. No? Very nice. Thank you. Thank you very much.